Praise God. God bless you. This is Gary Costello coming to you live from Awesome Church. And how is your Saturday going? I've had an amazing time in the house of God preparing for the Lord's Day. Tomorrow morning at Awesome Church, 10 a.m., we are going to have an amazing time. It's our next D-Day. Praise God. Deliverance Day. It's titled Inner Healing 7 Pagan Spirits. Now, if you've never attended one of our D-Days, our Deliverance Days, let me tell you, it is, I've been told by many people, it is by far perhaps the most focused and most intense and most directed ministry for salvation, healing and deliverance in the whole nation. Now, that's people have told me that. People have flown in from all over the country to experience and to attend one of our D-Days for ministry to receive salvation, to receive healing and deliverance, to have, you know, the works of the enemy broken off their lives so that they can live a life without oppression, without demonic affliction, without curses. And let me tell you, it is alive and well on the earth today, demonic power. In fact, the Bible says that the God of the earth in the book of Corinthians says it is the devil himself. Now, he's not the God of the universe but he is the God that hovers over the atmosphere of the earth, afflicting people even this very day. And that's why people suffer with all kinds of oppressions and depressions and unexplained illnesses and demonic affliction because of the work of the enemy. But the great news is that the church of Jesus Christ, hallelujah, with the Holy Bible, the sword of the spirit, we have the answer to see people saved, healed, and delivered. And tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., it is our next D-Day. And I want to encourage you that if you're in the Sydney area, get to Awesome Church. Even if you're outside of Sydney and you're watching this, you still have time. Get to Awesome Church tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Our church meets, praise God, at 4 Euston Street, Rydalmere, in our beautiful worship center. You would be my guest. And we're going to be dealing with inner healing, And uh, that's going to be titled, subtitled, Pagan Spirits. Now, where did that title come from? Well, it's biblical. Joshua had to deal with seven pagan tribes, and they represent spirits on the earth that are still present. And as I share about them, you will see, and perhaps you may even identify with some of them that are afflicting you right now. And we've seen so many people over the years, thousands of people since we began hosting D-Days way back in 2017. And it's just been phenomenal to see so many people whose lives have been transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's happening tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Hallelujah. But today we are continuing our series on the anointing. This is part three, and it's my Saturday series. And I've been just inundated with emails and messages from people. And thank you for all your emails and messages and comments of people have just been so encouraged and so strengthened by these messages. And uh, I'm in the house of God today. I've had a wonderful afternoon of prayer and study and just preparing, fasting, seeking the Lord, getting ready for the Lord's day. But I've got something special that I want to share with you today. So why don't we pray, get a Bible, a notebook and a pen, and let's get into the anointing part three. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to share your word with all my Facebook friends and my YouTube friends, and may the blessing of the Lord be upon them in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. The anointing. Wow, what a subject. You know, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. What a powerful portion of scripture this is. And the Bible says in Luke 4, 18, hallelujah, it says this, This this is Jesus quoting from the prophet Isaiah, and he's in the synagogue. He's opened up the scroll. This is the very first message that Jesus ever preached, and these were the words that came out of his mouth. Now, remember, what he spoke set the platform for his ministry of what he was going to do for the next three and a half years. In verse 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Hallelujah. You see, the anointing is when the spirit of the Lord comes upon you. That's what the anointing is. 
And when that anointing comes, Jesus went on to say, he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And the Bible goes on to say, then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Wow. How awesome is that? When Jesus turned up onto the scene, everything changed on planet Earth because he literally said the devil's days are now numbered. I'm here on the earth to war against the demonic spirits that plague this planet. And I'm going to bring freedom to people's lives internally, externally. I'm going to release them from all curses. And Jesus began that. And as you read the Gospels, you'll see the ministry of Christ all over the all over that region where he was ministering. And he gave that authority and his power to the church. And we, 2,000 years later, think about that. We're continuing the same mission that our Lord and Savior started 2,000 years ago. That's the good news. That's why this series on the anointing is so important. In Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27, from the Passion Bible, it says, In that day, the Lord will remove the heavy burden from your shoulders and break off the yoke of bondage from your necks because of the heavy anointing upon you. Wow, what a verse. In other words, when the Spirit of God comes, the anointing is going to break every yoke and remove every burden off your life. And my prayer today, Father in heaven, is that the anointing would do that for my wonderful friends that are watching this broadcast. You know, the Holy Spirit has directed me to share on this very important subject as it relates to the four very important areas of our lives. And I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to also move mightily in our lives. Those four areas are personally, our personal lives, at home, in our families, the home front, at work, with our livelihoods, and of course, in the church, in our ministry, or in a group of the family of believers. The anointing is for all of those realms of our existence. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is the most powerful force that exists on the earth today. And you know what? God wants us to live with his anointing present in our lives. So we have to understand the anointing, what it is, and how the anointing will manifest in our lives. That's what this whole series is about. You know, our theme at Awesome Church, praise God, is 2024, the Great Commission. If you want a copy of this commemorative booklet, send me an email right here. Glory to God. You can send that email to info at awesomechurch.com and I will send you out a copy of this booklet. Many people have requested this and I've sent them out. Equally, if you have a prayer need, you can send your prayer request. There's the email address right there. And I will pray over your prayer request for 30 days and uphold the prayer in all our meetings. And we're going to believe God to answer that prayer in Jesus' name. You know, the anointing is the most powerful force on the earth today. Praise God. And our theme, the Great Commission, we're believing for powerful displays of miracle signs and wonders in people's lives. But it's going to take the anointing of the Holy Spirit to do it. You know, there's a catchphrase at Awesome Church. It goes like this. If you believe it, you'll see it. If you expect it, you'll experience it. I, I, I truly believe that what's missing in many churches today is this, this belief that they'll see it and this expectation that they'll experience it. But that's exactly what the church of Jesus Christ should be doing, is getting people to believe and to expect that they're going to see and they're going to experience. And I know tomorrow at Awesome Church when we gather, I want you to come believing and expecting that you're going to see the power of God and you will experience the power of God. You know, if we want to know the supernatural and move in it, we need revelation and an understanding of the connection, listen carefully, the connection between faith and the anointing. 
And there is a direct connection between both faith and the anointing. A lot of people will focus on faith and leave the anointing out, or some will focus on the anointing, but they've left faith out. What I've discovered in over 37 years of being a born-again Christian, and 28 of those years was has been in ministry, is that faith and the anointing are two essential ingredients for the miraculous. Faith is acting on God's word. And when faith connects with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, miracle signs and wonders will manifest. And this is why, this is why faith is always under attack. It's always under attack. You just go on the YouTube channel, you type in faith preachers, and they're the ones that all get criticized. They're the ones that always come under attack. Anyone connected to the word of faith, which in many cases is misunderstood. And in some areas, there might be some abuse that takes place with some of the ministers in what they teach. But that's no different to any minister from any denomination. And I can show you, you know, people taking a message and distorting it. I've seen people take the grace message and distort something that's beautiful to make it say, say things that's not actually grace. But the same thing is said for the word of faith. I've heard uh, shocking things said about the word of faith that as a word of faith preacher, I've never believed or never practiced or never even experienced. And I'm wondering, where do they get this from? And so we need to be so careful that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and dismiss everything of faith because we've seen something or read something that has been a distortion of what the word of God says. And let me tell you, YouTube is full of demonically edited little programs and documentaries that are attacking Christians, attacking the word of faith, attacking ministers of the gospel in such a way to discredit them. But I tell you something, at the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding. Look at the fruit. Look at the word that's being preached and look at the results that come from it. At the end of the day, Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. You know, one thing I've discovered about critics is that they, they don't bear any fruit. You look at their lives and you don't see anything. You don't see any activation of what, you know, they propose to believe. They're generally miserable. They're generally very judgmental. They're generally, you know, sick, oppressed, and yet they're attacking everyone that's of faith. Then I look at the faith people and I see them healthy, happy, wise, full of faith, full of joy, prospering, blessed, full of praise. You know, there might be challenges, but still they've just got this spirit of endurance about them. And there's just a sense of purpose that God can. Well, I know what camp I'd rather be in. I'd rather be in the faith camp. Hallelujah. But faith is always under attack. In Luke chapter 18, verse 1, it says, One day Jesus told his disciples a story to illustrate their need for constant prayer and to show them that they must keep praying until the answer comes. There was a city. There was a city a judge, he said, a very godless man who had great contempt for everyone. A widow of that city came to him frequently to appeal for justice against a man who had harmed her. The judge ignored her for a while, but eventually she got on his nerves. I fear neither God nor man, he said to himself, but this woman bothers me. I'm going to see that she gets justice for she is wearing me out with her constant coming. Then the Lord said, if even an evil judge can be worn down like that, don't you think that God will surely give justice to his people who plead with him day and night? In verse eight says, yes, he will answer them quickly. But the question is, when I, the Messiah, return, how many will I find who have faith and are praying? That's straight out of the, the mouth of Jesus. That's Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. I read it from the Living Bible Translation. Jesus is very clear. He says, you've got to keep on praying. You've you got to keep on pursuing the things of God. Keep knocking on the door. Keep believing that the answer is coming. But he also says that when I return, he says in verse 8, will I find faith and anyone praying? So ask yourself as a believer, are you walking in faith? Are you really engaged in prayer? And I mean 
You know, focused and solid prayer. You know, it's amazing how many believers give up praying because they prayed for a little while, nothing happened, and they just gave up and quit. And they said, well, this prayer, you know, is meaningless. That's why prayer meetings are usually the most least attended meeting in any church. Thank God at Awesome Church at our midweek prayer meetings, it's, it's, it's pretty big. There's a lot of people that come, and it's a robust meeting. And I want to encourage you that if you want to be part of a revival prayer meeting, come along to Awesome Church this Wednesday night at 7.30, and I can guarantee you, you'll see the power of God move like never before. But we need to be praying, and we need to be praying faith prayers, and we need to be in faith. Right here in this parable, we see the Lord declaring that he is looking for people of faith. But we also see the connection between faith and praying. But notice what Jesus said in verse 8. How many will I find who have faith? The Amplified Bible says, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find this kind of persistent faith on the earth? Why is having faith so important? And remember, faith is not believing. Please don't ever confuse the two, because a lot of people believe and they call that faith. But believing and having faith are two different things altogether. I can believe and that's not faith. What's faith? Faith is when you act on the word of God. Very different to believing. Believing means to take true facts that are presented. So someone presents you with facts, you believe it. But you're not necessarily acting on those facts. But when someone presents you the word, and you act on the word, that's called faith. That's faith right there. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When I take hold of the evidence of God's word and I act on it, I'm in the faith zone. And so you can make a giant leap in your Christianity from going from believing to having faith the moment you take hold of God's word and obey it. That's faith. Hallelujah. You know something? You can be believing all day but never actually be acting on God's word. But the moment you act on God's word, you are in faith. You know, every time I share that, I always get messages from people saying, I had a light bulb experience. I got a revelation. And it's changed so many people in my church when they've understood their difference. Because many people, many good Christians are just believing hard, but they don't see results. But the moment they step out and act on the word, faith is released. That's what pleases God. Hebrews 11 verse 6. And how powerful is faith? Faith is so powerful that Jesus said it can move a mountain. (laughs) Hallelujah. Praise God. In Matthew 17, 20, Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Praise God. Some of you need to read that verse and meditate on it. Some of you Christians who just have a lot of unbelief, you need to read Matthew 17, 20. And you need to believe, you need to believe what you read and then act on it. He said nothing will be impossible for you. You can move that mountain. You can move that mountain of sickness and fear and oppression and poverty. You can command that. You speak to that mountain. You say, get out of my life in Jesus' name. Whatever that mountain is in your life, in Jesus' name, it can be moved. But it's also your faith by acting on this word that Jesus spoke that's going to move mountains. Come on, church. Start to speak to those mountains today. Sickness, move. Fear, move. Depression, move. Lack, move. Need, move. Addictions, move. Or whatever obstacle you are facing. Come on, command it now. Move in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now, notice that Jesus said in Matthew 17, 20, because of your unbelief. I can tell you that unbelief, it comes in many, many forms. Firstly, Unbelief, catch this, unbelief is not, unbelief is not not knowing something. That's not unbelief. Well, I didn't know. No, that's not unbelief, biblically speaking. In other words, I don't believe because I don't know. That's not unbelief. 
That's what a lot of people in the world call unbelief. I don't know. So how can I believe something I don't know? That's not unbelief, biblically speaking. Biblically speaking, Jesus is talking about unbelief is choosing not to believe. Big difference. When I choose not to believe after I've been presented with what the word of God says, that's biblical unbelief. It's not knowing something. It's knowing it but choosing not to believe in it. And how many Christians are trapped in that right now? They know what the word says, but they just don't believe it. They're not prepared to act on it. That's unbelief. And there are plenty of Christians who love Jesus walking around with unbelief right now. I tell you something, it is a powerful revelation the moment you understand that faith acts on what God's word says. That's a powerful revelation. In Matthew 14, verse 25. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to the disciples walking on the sea. <laughs> oh, wow. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on water. Wow. Second man to ever walk on water. Jesus was the first. Peter was the next one. Praise God. And he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? The NLT translation says, why did you doubt me? Why did you doubt me? Jesus is saying. The Passion Bible says, why would you let doubt win? Oh, I like that one. Why would you let doubt win? Why are some of you Christians that love Jesus? Come on, you're good people. You love Jesus but you've allowed unbelief to control your life. You're letting doubt, doubting God's word, and you're letting it win in your life. Don't let doubt win in your life. Believe what Jesus said. You know, along with unbelief is fear. And fear says, fear says this, fear says, what if I obey the word and nothing happens? And you know, I, I've got plenty of preacher friends who won't step out to do healing and deliverance because they're afraid if I step out, what happens if nothing happens? Well, my answer to that is what happens if you step out and something does happen? <laughs> Praise God. What I've discovered in my ministry is that the more I step out, the more stuff happens. But when I'm not stepping out, nothing's going to happen. But I can't let the fear of that stop me from praying for people. I can't let the fear of that stopping me from obeying the word. I've got to believe God's word. I've got to, as a believer, I, I, I'm a hypocrite if I say I worship Jesus, but I don't believe his word. That's hip, it's, it's hypocrisy. No, I've got to believe in Christ, love Christ, worship Christ, follow Christ, but believe his word and be prepared to act on it. So I can't let fear rob me. You know, fear is an insidious, insidious um, trait that if it gets onto you, and fear can be a spirit as well. And if fear is dominating your life, then I encourage you get to Awesome Church tomorrow morning for our D Day because we're going to be praying for people. There's going to be breaking curses, deliverance, inner healing, anointing with oil, the dismantling of strongholds of the mind. And we're going to bind fear and we're going to put fear in its place. So I encourage you to get along tomorrow morning at Awesome Church. In 1 John 4 18, it says fear involves torment. Wow. That's what fear does. It torments a person. Fear is a controlling force and only God's word can neutralize it. Only God's word. You know, the opposite of fear is faith. Where does faith come from? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. When faith comes, fear is flushed out. Remember the story of Peter walking on the water. The moment he looked at the winds and the waves, he began to sink. Church, we have to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ and we will do the impossible. 
And for me, the way I keep my eyes on Jesus Christ is I keep my eye on the word. I keep my eye on the Holy Bible. And as I do that, my faith is assured. Hallelujah. I want to remind you of what the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. See, fear can be a demonic spirit, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's what God gives us. He gives you power. He gives you love. And he gives you a sound mind. You have an anointing on your life from God that is like a force field of protection. And all you need to do is stir up faith in you by activating the word of God in your life. Remember Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you're struggling with fear, Write down these scriptures, write down and meditate on these scriptures and confess these scriptures. Meditating means you take a verse and you just focus on it and you think about it and you read it and then you confess it and you declare it and you make that word yours. Write down Psalm 91, write that down. Write down Psalm 34, write down Psalm 37. Those three Psalms in particular, 34, 37, 91. And meditate, declare them, confess them. And they are powerful scriptures to war against the spirit of fear. Feel the power of God's word being released from your lips as you confess it, coming from your innermost being and stir faith up to combat all doubt. For instance, when I take hold of Psalm 91, I, I feel the scripture. The Bible says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him, I will trust. Man, I walk around the room and I just declare that scripture and I keep declaring it until it becomes part of my innermost being. That's faith, friend. That's faith. You see, church, faith people are word people. They're word of God people because Jesus was a word of God man. And when I say word, I mean the Holy Bible. And this is what makes you a faith person. You want to be a word of faith person? Be a word of God person. That's a faith person. That's how you become a faith person and a word person. Hallelujah. How important is the word of God to faith? Well, look at what the Bible says. John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. And that's a great verse for those oneness Pentecostals who don't believe in the Trinity. It's amazing. Jesus said we. Why would he say we if he's talking about himself? He would just said I will come. No, he said me and the father. We will come to him and we will make our home with him. What about John 15 verse 7? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. The Passion Bible says, but if you live in life union with me, and if my words live powerfully with you, then you can ask whatever you desire, and it will be done. What's the key? Letting the word abide in you, using the word when you pray, making the word of God your foundation of belief. Hallelujah. Now, you know something? Satan knows this as well. He knows what Jesus said about the word. He knows that God's word in you is a powerful force. And for this reason, he will do everything to make sure this word does not get into your spirit. He'll do everything to stop it because he knows the word of God is living and powerful. It is dangerous to his kingdom. When you take the word and you declare it in Luke 8 verse 11, the Bible says that the seed is the word of God. The word of God is a living, growing seed. And when it's planted into your life, it has the potential to do the impossible. Praise God. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living and powerful. So when I take the word, I can sow it like a seed into my own life or into the life of people that I love. I can sow it into your life, right? I'm doing right now. I'm sowing the seed of God's word. And if you accept that seed and it starts to grow, you're going to get the fruit of all the promises of what God's word says. So I take God's word 
and I plant it into the soil of your heart. And watch what happens. Luke 13 verse 18 says, then he said, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? Is it, it, is, it, 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 it? it is like a mustard seed which a man took and put in his garden. He put it in his garden. So you can sow the word into your own life. And it grew and became a large tree and the birds of the air nested in its branches. But that same mustard seed faith, Jesus said, can do this. He said in Luke 17, verse 6. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted into the sea and it would obey you. Church, the it has to obey you in Jesus name, whatever the it is, whatever that it is, you use the word as a weapon against it. As I said, Satan knows all of this. And this is why his chief aim is to keep the word of God out of you. Because if it's in you, it will begin and you act on it. It's going to grow and you're going to get the fruit of it. You know, Mark 4.15 in the parable of the sower. It's interesting what Jesus said. He said in verse 15, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When Satan hears and comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. That is a very, very powerful and important scripture. It's Jesus is saying when the word comes into your life, because Satan knows how powerful the word is, he said he comes immediately. Immediately. You know how fast that is? Like that. He comes immediately to remove the word out of you so that it doesn't grow. And I tell you, there are believers who come to church. They hear the word. It gets planted. Something in them says, praise God. But even before they leave the church, many of them have doubted it and said, no, that can't be true. And Satan comes immediately and just steals the word. And they leave saying, I don't believe in miracles, signs and wonders. I don't believe in tongues. I don't believe in the gifts of the spirit. You know, I don't believe in, I don't believe in the word. It's just a book written by people. And all of a sudden, what have they done? Satan's removed the word. And when the word's removed, I've got news for you. Nothing's growing. Nothing's growing. Believers that are not in the word and they're not hearing the word. Nothing's growing. You might think something's growing. I'll tell you what's growing. Unbelief and fear is growing. But when you got the word, faith is going to be growing inside of your life. Miracle signs and wonders happen because people believe and have faith by acting on God's word. And the gospels have so many examples of this truth. In Matthew 8 verse 1, when he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand, touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. The Passion Bible says in verse 3, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the leper and said, of course, I want to heal you, be healed. And instantly, all signs of leprosy disappear. What was the key? Faith is the key that unlocks the anointing. When faith connects with the anointing, miracles are going to manifest. It's not enough to just walk into church and you know the anointing is present, but you have no faith. You don't believe God's word. Nothing's going to happen. The Bible says that a crowd of people gathered around Jesus, but there was one little old lady who had a problem. She pressed through the crowd. She touched Jesus and she said, if I touch the hem of his garment, I know that I'll be healed. What did she have? She had faith. And when faith touched the anointing, the anointed one, she got instantly healed. Praise God. Well, did you enjoy today's message? Just another short faith booster to get you encouraged in your faith. And my prayer for you is that in Jesus' name, the Spirit of God would touch your faith today and that a miracle would manifest in Jesus' name. Praise God. Well, before you go, if you like this message, like it, leave a comment, share it more than anything, do that. In the meantime, let me tell you some exciting news about what's coming up at Awesome Church tomorrow morning. 
Praise God at 10 a.m. It is our next D-Day, Deliverance Day. In a Healing 7, it's subtitled Pagan Spirits. We're going to be sharing about the pagan spirits that are on the earth today causing affliction. And when those pagan spirits are bound off people's lives, miracles will manifest. That's going to be happening tomorrow. Breaking curses, deliverance, inner healing, the anointing with oil. It's going to be a very powerful time. My ministry team has prayed up. We're ready to go. We're ready to rumble with the devil and have victory in Jesus' name for your life in Jesus' name. I also want to tell you about Easter's coming up next week. And we have a wonderful Good Friday service at 5 p.m. So come along to Awesome Church on Good Friday, 5 p.m. for our very special Good Friday service. I've got a very powerful message about the cross. Is there any greater message than the cross? It is a message that's going to release the power of God. That's happening at 5 p.m. Good Friday. And of course, Resurrection Sunday. Glory to God. 10 a.m. at Awesome Church. He is risen. And we are going to be celebrating the power of the resurrected Christ. That's happening on Easter Sunday. Some, some great events coming up at Awesome Church. And I encourage you to get along. Well, this is Gary Costello signing off from another episode of The Anointing. Next Saturday, I want to talk to you a little bit about what happened to Jesus between Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. And it will be Saturday. And that is a very important day. That's not celebrated. But actually, what happened on Saturday is just as important as what happened Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. And I'm going to teach you, I call it Supernatural Saturday. Hallelujah. I'm going to show you what actually happened. Where did Jesus go? What did he do? That's going to be something to look forward to. That's going to be happening next Saturday at 4 p.m. Let people know about that. It's going to be a great, great teaching. Well, this is Gary Costello signing off. Have a wonderful weekend wherever you are. I look forward to seeing you at church or online in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.